Hi, and we're in Yosemite with uh, park ranger Carrie Cobb, speaking about your, this beautiful place. Can you tell us a little bit about the park and um, some, some facts that people don't generally know about it? Yosemite is located in California. Uh, we make up a majority of the Sierra Nevada, which is a mountain range that goes right through the heart of Yosemite National Park. We were formed in 1890, set aside. Um, originally, there was parts of the park, including Yosemite Valley, as well as the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias, that was actually set aside by Abraham Lincoln in 1864, and it was given to the state. In 1890, we actually formed Yosemite National Park and later included Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias back into Yosemite National Park. And what people don't realize when they come here is that Yosemite is roughly the size of Rhode Island, so we're a pretty big park, and 94% of the park is designated wilderness. So we have only developed roughly about 6% of the park. So most of what you see in Yosemite National Park is wild and pretty untouched by humans. Right. Um, what are your, I guess, biggest problems as a, as a park service? Just, I'm guessing the tons of tourists are both, both the benefit and the, and the problem and what about you know just how you, I mean if somebody's very popular getting people here but do you have any problems you know, reaching out to people and, and certain types of people well Yosemite National Park sees about four million visitors per year we're a very very popular park and people come from all over the world to come to Yosemite one of the things that we grapple with here, specifically in Yosemite, is that 90% of our visitors come to Yosemite Valley, which is where we're sitting right now. Yosemite Valley makes about 3% of the entire park. So a lot of people come to a very small part of the park. We're roughly about seven miles long and um, one mile wide. So trying to get that many people here into the park and dealing with their cars is an issue. We have an amazing shuttle bus system that brings visitors around the park. We ask visitors to park their car, get on the shuttle bus, don't touch that car again until they have to maybe leave or go back to their campsites. In addition, we have issues with people going out and forming social trails of their own. Of course, that uh, increases erosion and impacts some of the resources. So what we like to do is create trails or we create boardwalks across meadows and it's not required for people to be on those boardwalks or on those trails but 90 percent of the visitors they stay on the trails uh, and that really helps us with with restoring these areas back to their natural settings but by still allowing people to come and see the beauty of the place um, and since you know we're very focused on I mean, we want everybody to see the beauty of the national parks, national forests of our country, but especially the young generation. Do you see as I mean, as a general trend? Do you have problems getting the young generation here? And maybe what kind of our programs do you guys do to reach you know reach out in California and just across the country? We have several programs in Yosemite that reach out to young people specifically. We have what's called the Junior Ranger Program where we um, have little kids um, up to the age of 12 actually that you go out and do different tasks in the park and they have to get a task book sign off uh, by a ranger and then we present them with a, with a badge and a little patch um, and they become Junior Rangers and so we teach them the mission of the park and how they can protect the parks. In addition, we have several programs. Um, one big program that we have is called through the Yosemite Institute. And what the Yosemite Institute does is that it brings uh, teenage kids from high school, uh, from different surrounding communities, and they come into the park and they're here for a couple weeks. They learn about everything from animals to the National Park Service organization to geography, and geology, and anything in between. And they'll also go and backpack and experience nature with different groups of people. So we have a pretty robust outreach to try to bring more young people into the park. In addition, we definitely see high numbers of families that come to the park. So they come and they bring their small children and they teach their children how to come into Yosemite and how to appreciate these natural places. Um, when we traveled around here today, we noticed that a lot of people here have a lot of foreign languages. Can you give us a kind of rough estimate what, what the breakdown is as you know, Americans versus international people that come to Yosemite? 
roughly about 60% of our visitors that come to the park are from California. Um, so that leaves about 40% from other places and about 20% of those that we see are coming from overseas. Our number one market is actually the Japanese, followed closely by the United Kingdom. Um, and then all of Europe after that. So we definitely see quite a number of different people that come from overseas. It's always amazing to me when I walk around that most of the people I'm hearing are speaking a different language and it's always really fun to guess and see where they're coming from. And a lot of people, have, they always say, this is uh, one of the places I've always wanted to go to. So it's really nice to see these people coming from different places and to give them the opportunity to see the beauty of Yosemite. Do you ever encounter that, um, you know, you feel like sometimes when you see so many international people, it's great, but on the other hand, it feels like it, these people really appreciate it, but it feels like there's so many Americans that, I know plenty of people in LA that live five hours away and like, they know about Yosemite. And does it ever feel like, you know, we, we as a country should appreciate our national parks and forests more and really see, you know, really get out here and see the treasures that are here? Well, the United States really has it figured out. There are so many foreign countries that, that are trying to base their national park system off of what we do. Even national parks in different countries don't have the same type of setup and organization that we have. For instance, in national parks, you're not allowed to hunt, and you're not allowed to collect, and you can't cut down trees. And the only people who live here are the people who work here. So the impact to the natural resource is very, very minimal. A lot of countries who have national parks run their parks very differently and they have more of an impact. So America, in, in the entire United States, we have over 394 National Park Service sites. That's, That's a pretty lovely. high number. So yeah. as far as getting people to appreciate their nat national parks and their natural settings, yeah. I think America does a pretty good job of really encouraging people and giving people the opportunity to go to their nearest national park or even their nearest national forest in getting out into the natural world. Well, I guess that kind of leads into my next question is, um, you know, a lot of parks are closely surrounded by national forests. You have the Santa Claus National Forest, I think all the way around, you have Sierra, Sierra National Forest nearby. What, do you, what is the interaction between National Park Service and National Forest Service? Because um, we've been talking, as we've been traveling, we've been talking to both Forest Service and Park Service and talking about the different um, tasks that that each one has, you know, Park Service is more conservation and, and um, Forest Service is more of a balance of, so what is the interaction here with Yosemite with the Stanislaus National Forest and the Sierra National Forest? Well, we actually work very, very well with other agencies, especially the National Forest Service, just because we are bordered by all of them. Um, we have different programs where we have Forest Service individuals come in. They help us with our prescribed burns. Uh, they help us when we have to do such things like um, marijuana garden raids. Um, so we actually have a very good relationship with them. We understand their boundaries and their borders and they understand ours, but anytime they need our help or we need their help, we're definitely willing to help each other out and we work very closely together. It's the only way that we can really protect these natural places. We, we have to work together. Right. That's great. And I think you mentioned an, another, you're kind of leading me on to these, but um, that you mentioned marijuana illegal growing, and especially we've heard from the Forest Service and Park Service in California, the West Coast, it's a big issue. Is that a you know, prominent issue in this area as well? You somebody the National Park has experienced uh, pot garden grows in the past. Um, we do have a program where our law enforcement rangers do search the park and make sure those types of illegal activities are not occurring. Um, they are very trained to look at the clues and to follow anything that leads them to illegal activity. So we definitely have a program where we stay on top of it and we let these people know that it's not okay to do that and we're not going to accept it. Have you seen serious impacts from places where they have actually found illegal growing because a, a lot of times they will use anything to, to grow it and, and we've heard this, you know, real devastation to forests. So. In the past, in some of the gardens that have been raided by Yosemite National Park officials, we have seen extreme devastation to the area. 
Um, these people will bring in pesticides. They throw their trash. There's piles and piles of trash. They don't have the proper food storage. So the animals and the bears are coming there. Um, it's, it can be very, very devastating. But the wonderful thing about Yosemite is that once these gardens are raided and once we go in and actually get rid of all the plants and it is safe to enter, we have other rangers that go in and they go and they spend hours and days just restoring that area to as natural of a setting as possible. So we really, once we're through with the law enforcement part of it, we really do take the time to bring it back to normal and help that area recover from the devastation that it has been impacted by. That's great. And I, on a closing thought, what would you say to anybody that, you know, has Yosemite in sight and just hasn't, is on the fence of whether to come here or not? What would you say to them? Yosemite National Park is an amazing place. It, you drive here and you're surrounded by rolling hills, but it, you really come around the corner and you see amazing views like Half Dome and our waterfalls. And we have the fifth tallest waterfall in the world here, and some of the granite that's carved out by glaciers millions of years ago, the shapes of them are absolutely amazing, and it's breathtaking. So the drive is 100% well worth it. <laughs> yes, so as we were driving today, we noticed there was um, a fire going happening. Can you talk about um, how you guys deal with, with natural fires and how you control it and, and the benefits it actually can have to, to for us? So the fire that you saw coming in today was a lightning strike that occurred on July 31st. It actually occurred in designated wilderness. Um, so what we've decided to do as a national park and our fire crews is actually manage this fire for multiple purposes. So we have a number of people who are up there uh, making sure that the fire doesn't go anywhere that's going to negatively impact structures or people. Now, in the past, we've had years where we've suppressed every single fire that started. And we've learned from that. It's not healthy for the forest to not have fires. When you suppress all fires, the forests become really thick and, and the undergrowth becomes so thick that you can't actually even walk through it. In addition, the larger trees get so tall and so big that they block any light from coming into the forest floor and not allowing any new trees to grow. So what we do is we take things like the lightning fires and we manage them and we kind of make the fire go where we need it to go to get rid of some of that underbrush and to thin out some of the upper trees that will stimulate the growth of new forest. There's some trees like the giant sequoia trees that cannot grow, they cannot reproduce and germinate without fire. Their little pine cones have to have fire in order to spread those seeds. So if you suppress all the fires, you have no more sequoia trees. So people look at fire and they think it has to be a bad thing, it has to be a negative thing, but fire really has some good benefits to the environment. And we take these opportunities when we can to manage them, have them go where we need them to go, and hopefully create less of an impact to the forest but also monitor air quality so that our visitors, when they come to the park, can still see Yosemite National Park. That's great. I think it's, it's really important to, to talk about it because a lot of people, and, you know, certain issues, especially if they see a fire or, you know, animal controls, things like that, they, it's kind of a, you can either do it or don't do it. And, and you have to understand that there's, you know, gray areas and there's times you need a fire and it's really important. That's, that's great to hear. It is very beneficial to our ecology in the park. Uh, great.